last presentation in the mo of the morning, uh, which opens up to what's planned for the future. Hossen Jafaya on the video monitoring of in Channel Wood. We're not there in Genesis yet, but we're moving there. Hossein, you have the floor. Uh, yeah, let's change a little to the uh, technical parts and technical aspects. Today, I want to talk to you about the uh, feasible uh, technique uh, video monitoring of uh, wood in reverse. I'm Hossein Gafarian, a uh, postdoctoral researcher at OVS Lyon and uh, research and development engineer at uh, GeoPECA. And in collaboration between these two societies, we are going to develop this technique uh, in reverse to be autonomous and uh, automatic. So uh, as our other colleagues uh, told, wood can be a source of uh, danger. Our question is uh, where they come from, how many, how much, and uh, when do they come to the reverse? And for answering to these questions, we have different techniques. For example, satellite image, uh, site investigation, uh, different tagging like GPS or RFID and video monitoring. But among these techniques, video monitoring can be an interesting uh, method because first it's cheap. We have a normal camera, a transmission unit and uh, uh, you need for detecting pieces of wood. It's continuous. We can record videos all day long. And recently we can also model data during the night. So it's totally continuous. Uh, we can uh, record data during the floods when we don't have normally access to the rivers. And also it's autonomous. And finally, we can extract many different information from the videos, for example, the amount of wood, the effect of, uh, for example, fluid discharge on wood discharge, and the wood characteristics like its velocity, its size, position, etc. So, as I mentioned, uh, video monitoring contains three main parts. First, camera, which records the data. Then we have to uh, save data on site or transmit them to a detection unit. And finally, detection unit, a normal computer. And now, uh, yeah, this is me who detect pieces of wood, but uh, our goal is to remove the operator and be totally uh, autonomous. For the moment, <coughs> we have four different sites uh, in uh, France, Allier, Ain, Genesia, and Isère, which we have camera. And uh, soon we will develop our cameras in different uh, basins. For example, we have Valzerin, uh, Achtas, uh, Sanjis, etc. So, and we can have uh, lots of statistics on these sites. But the most important uh, among all these uh, watersheds, the most important for me was the Arn River because we have the largest database uh, on the Arn River. We have recorded this data since 2007, and we have a huge uh, database at this site. Here, for example, I give you uh, an example of uh, wood detection. Uh, we extract a six-day event uh, flood uh, uh, on the Arn River. It takes us one month or more to detect them manually. Just we sit down uh, behind the computer, and we detect pieces of wood. But automatically, with a very normal computer, very cheap computer, it, we can do it in real time. And with a powerful computer, we can do uh, detect all these uh, six days in maybe less than two hours. But to do that, we need a logistics. We need a software. We have already developed a software who can detect uh, pieces of wood automatically. And we publish a paper on it. Uh, this software is developed by Pierre Lomer, and I applied some post treatments on this uh, uh, software. This software can detect pieces of wood automatically, but in parallel, we had uh, many uh, wrong detections. 
So the per performance of the software was not enough. And we cannot, uh, for the moment, uh, execute the model, the software in real time. So we introduced two main objectives for us. First, <coughs> we want to develop a step for post-treatment to minimize the false detections. And then we run the code in real time. For the first objective, first, uh, let me to, uh, explain you two, uh, mean, uh, two main uh, notations, the precision rate and recall rate. Imagine that, uh, please imagine that uh, there are different possibilities uh, in a software. So we have some pieces of wood that software can detect them. So they are located in uh, detections and they are correct. We name them true positive. We have also some detections by software that they are not correct. They are only, I don't know, wags or some other things. So we name them as false positive. So all pieces inside this area are detected by the software. Some are correct, some are not correct. And also we have some pieces that are in the river, but software could not detect them. So they are uh, false positives, false negatives. To uh, calculate the performance of software, we introduce two parameters, precision, which means that uh, how many of these selected items are correct, are relevant. And we have also recall rate, which shows that among the all relevant parameters, among all pieces of wood, how many does the software detect? So to uh, a software be reliable, both these parameters, precision and recall rate, should be uh, as high as possible. And in a river, we have many different parameters that reduce uh, these uh, two parameters. For example, we have many waves inside the river. We have a uh, low visibility due to the reflection of the sun or fog. And also we have a uh, lack of uh, luminosity. So when we run the computer, the uh, software for the first time, the raw results gives us 64% uh, of precision and 50% of recall rate, which shows us that the post-treatment is necessary. Then I develop a post-treatment uh, procedure to increase the precision rate. So we have different characteristics uh, of wood in river, for example, uh, different characteristics, either wood, either optical, I don't know, different parameters. For example, the optical state, we have some waves here, which are the light roughnesses. We have also some uh, dark roughnesses that uh, computer can detect them as piece of wood. And we have a smooth glue, which is the best for detecting a piece of wood. We have also the dynamic of wood. For example, a piece of wood comes from here. It moves in, in different steps, in different frames, and out from here. So we have a velocity, we have position, et cetera, that we can take benefit of them and post-treat our data. And finally, we have also the size, the position of the piece of wood. A piece of wood near the camera, near the camera, we can detect small pieces of wood, but far from camera, we can detect only the largest pieces. So when we run the computer first, we had 64% precision. Then we uh, take benefit of 14 different parameters on the river, which are the characteristics of wood, size, position, et cetera, dynamic, velocity in X and Y direction, uh, acceleration, et cetera, hydraulic of the river, for example, discharge uh, and optical states. And we reach 85% uh, precision, taking benefit of the neural network. We give all these parameters to the neural network, train the software, and it can decide if a piece of wood is uh, true positive or false positive. And with 85% precision, we detect, uh, we distinguish between these two uh, detections.
and with a very small annotation. As I told you, we have 14 years data on our river. Only during two days, I annotate uh, manually some other data and I could increase precision to 99% by only annotating some uh, parts that we have uh, more possibility to be a root. After this, is, uh, this uh, section, uh, we, so we have a very good precision of software. The next step is uh, to increase also the recall rate, the pieces that were in the river, but uh, software could not detect them. So it was necessary to compare uh, the detections with some uh, operator annotations. So we had six different events that has uh, already uh, annotated by operators, uh, Dr. Bruce McVicar and Dr. Zhang Ji. And here, for example, you can see the length distribution of pieces of wood in blue that they extract by their eye and uh, manually. And the red line are, is the detection of the wood detections by software. And as you can see, software could not detect smaller parts. <clears throat> also in terms of piece number, as you can see, the operator annotation are normally two times more than uh, software detection. So again, taking benefit of these data and by comparing this with data, uh, we could uh, model, we could uh, predict the pieces that were in the river, but software could not detect them. And by reproducing this data, we reach the recall rate of 99%. And then I, uh, let's go to the next step and I explain you. So for the, for the first objective, uh, yeah, we, has, we develop a post-treatment step to increase precision and recall rate. And now we have very good precision and recall rate. And when I tell you about 99%, it's actually huge. But uh, I, uh, from all the data we had, uh, as I told you, we have uh, 14 years of data. I extract 4,000 uh, true positive and 4,000 false, uh, true positive and false uh, positive, uh, in general, 8,000, uh, and uh, randomly, and I check them. Uh, and I found that after all these steps, we have 99% precision and recall rate. So at the end of this step, we have uh, detections with the same length distribution uh, as we have on the river uh, with a very high precision and recall rate. So our next step after we have a reliable software is to run it in real time, which is my next step. For this step, for the moment, we have a detection module, which I show you, which we can detect pieces of wood, either false positive or true positive. Then taking benefit of a post-treatment module containing neural network and some other post-treatments, uh, I don't want to go into go to the details, but with the post-treatment module, we can decide between true or false positives. For example, if the neural network gives us 89% of precision, we can be almost sure that this, piece, this is a piece of wood. And if it gives us only 5% of precision, we can be almost sure that it's false positive. All these steps takes uh, less than one centisecond, which means that uh, from the step software detects a piece of wood to the decision, is too small, so we can run it in real time. But we have to uh, pay attention that preparing this uh, post-treatment step takes some time, between one to two months it takes me to prepare the neural network, to prepare the rectification uh, uh, matrices, et cetera. There are different steps to prepare them, but when, they, when we uh, prepare all these matrices and all these steps, it takes, yeah, less than one centisecond to calculate, to decide if a piece of wood is true positive or false positive. And when we develop these two parts, when we add actually these two parts to our detection model, we can run this model in real time. Thank you for your attention and I'm available for 
uh, any question. Do we have questions from the participants about the technique uh, developed uh, in the Chazet sur A uh, station? We have a video station operating since 2007. The idea is to apply it to install cameras upstream from Genicia to have a better control over the flow of um, in-channel wood uh, based on the uh, based also on the tributaries. There was a question from Nicolas Rabin. We were not able to answer during the previous uh, previous presentation. Is there a correlation between the various studies and especially the video observation of the flow, uh, which I mentioned uh, as an introduction, and the study of the isotopes? And is it considered? Actually, uh, I cannot uh, extract the chemical characteristics of wood, but very precisely, I can give you the, the amount of wood passing from each uh, sub basin. So if we have a camera at Valzerin and we have another one at uh, Arve, which we are going to install them, uh, we can actually give you the amount of wood coming from each part. Uh, yeah, that's uh, what I can extract from uh, this data and also the length distribution. I don't know if the typical length of uh, wood pieces can help uh, Javier to uh, distinguish between these two as a reservoir or no, but I can extract this data. Mm -hmm. ouais, je sais pas si quelqu'un veut intervenir. I'm not sure if some, any, any Virginia, Javier, do you want to add something or not? Yeah, like actually I read this question and it could be really great to try to combine both once I have my, everything more developed and more detailed my project. So yeah, thank you. But something that uh, I'm thinking, actually we have to uh, think about this question and uh, find a kind of correlation between these two, but we can uh, extract the wood volume coming from each uh, section and uh, if, for example, in a flood, we have uh, more wood coming from one specific uh, sub-basin. So we know that most of the woods at the uh, Genesia coming from, let's say, Valzerin. And then if we go and uh, extract the, um, the chemical uh, aspects of these woods from the Genesia, so we can, I think we can find a good correlation, uh, a good, uh, Mm, characteristics, chemical characteristics coming from each section, and we can have more precise data uh, like this. If we know that, for example, at this sp specific flood, these woods come from uh, a specific uh, sub basin. So, if I can add something, I, I would say that the, the goal for Javier would be to. Um, uh, give us more ideas at the catchment scale. So from each of those, Arf and Valserin, um, where specifically wood comes from. So even if we install cameras, of course, this is a key information because we will know which tributary is supplying more wood, but still we don't know where the wood comes from within the Arf and within the Valserin. And Javier is combining the isotope ratios and the chemical composition to actually infer in a more uh, detailed scale, spatial scale, uh, where the wood comes from. So in fact, the idea is to combine uh, all the approaches because each type of method uh, is giving us different information. And if we combine all, we will get the best results. So, uh, for the first order of magnitude, let's say, identifying which tributary is uh, supplying more food, yeah, the cameras will, will be used to validate what Javier is, is looking or is observing. Uh, but then he, he could go, uh, hopefully, a step further and say, within the catchment, if the wood is coming from more upstream or a specific sub-tributaries or sub-catchment, etc.
Yeah, I think so. I think uh, using the camera, you can validate your study for the first step to extract the characteristics. And in the next step, you can be independent and you can predict where they come from, exactly. Une question de Nicolas Rabin. Je pense One que question from Nicolas Rabin. It could be for you, Virginia, on the, the algorithm that can be used to do video detection. So a complementary work that we are also doing uh, in Lausanne in collaboration with uh, Hervé and Dion. Uh, there is another PhD student doing now his PhD thesis, uh, developing a, a, a software also, a, um, machine learning or artificial intelligence software training a neural network to automatically detect and track the wood. Um, so he's using a similar approach that uh, one that has been used for tracking and monitoring plastics in rivers. And um, it's a slightly different approach than the one Hussein just uh, presented. But the idea is that, of course, we are um, collaborating and, and combining efforts. So uh, we are also installing cameras in some rivers in Switzerland. Uh, in which we have also um, information from wood itself, so tracking using um, radio transmitters and, and tagging pieces of wood. Uh, so yeah, this is a, a, also a um, method that is in progress and uh, something that will be developed uh, quite soon, I would say. And to complete uh, Virginia's statement, here in this uh, software also, in this procedure, uh, we are taking benefit of artificial intelligence to train the software to uh, from the 14 different parameters I explained you already to decide if this is a, I don't know, a reflection of uh, sun or it is a wood. So yeah, actually we taking benefit of these new techniques to for decision uh, part. Merci beaucoup pour ces réponses là. Est-ce qu'il y a d'autres questions? Thank you for the answers. Any other questions? Commentaires par rapport à comments, remarks, uh, possibly concerning other sites or our colleagues from Siena who works on the Genesia Dam, uh, do they have, do you have comments or reactions vis-à-vis uh, -vis what's been presented in the 20 years of work on the flux, fluxes of wood? Virginia, you said that in the, in the in Geneva Lac, there is a, a drone at the uh, 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 wood is stored. Do they have a system to stop the, the wood and the... Uh, At some the part, on. yeah, it's ba yes. basically located um, at the uh, inflow from the run upstream. So when the run flows into the Geneva Lake, they sometimes they install a retention, floating retention structure to uh, prevent the wood from spreading uh, on the lake, basically to prevent any damages to, to for navigation. That was your question, right? Oui, oui, oui. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and also uh, uh, it's very localized, so it's, it's really depends on, on the rivers flowing through the lake, sometimes also in the Veve uh, stream, which is uh, also flowing to the lake, they sometimes they, they get these barriers uh, just for keeping the wood close to the shore, which makes it easier to extract. So actually lakes like Geneva, well, Geneva Lake is very big, but uh, lakes, they, they act as reservoirs. So we could actually use the wood arriving to the lakes also in the same way as we do in, in Genesia. Yeah. Les volumes de stockage, tu sais pas? No, we really don't know. This is something to look at. Yes. 
Absolutely. That is really difficult to estimate because, um, so Genesia Reservoir is relatively small. All the wood is extracted uh, at the same time and by the same managers. At Geneva Lake, there are so many uh, actors. So it depends on which uh, town or commune um, is managing the shore of the lake, they may extract the wood at different times and store the wood at different times too. So Geneva Lake is a different scale, I would say, but absolutely interesting to look at the amount of wood arriving. Yes, yeah, because the run upstream is quite active too. So. Genicia constitue véritablement uh, un site expérimental. Genicia is an experimental site, which is quite exceptional in a way, due to the fact that uh, we are able to have access to the material uh, and, well, nothing flows through. Whereas in many works, part of the floating or the internal wood flows through, especially at the most critical time during floods, where the dam is open, the, the wares are open and the spillways are open and I've seldom seen uh, such sites where such work could be actually done. Now, now if we uh, do a summary of the 20 years now, uh, 23 years actually, uh, I do believe that concerning the uh, wood in flow, fluxes, we've made the headways and we can detect almost in real time between a year or two, we will be able to detect the the wood flow on the Ain River, but now the goal is to apply it to a camera networks at the scale of catchment basin. So, so we did. Uh, we made a choice, and we hope to be able to work upstream from Genicia, but also in the Loire Basin, Loire River Basin, with other partners to be able to compare different situations. And Virginia showed that in in Switzerland, they are also deploying new cameras. So we get to the point where we can disseminate the techniques and uh, we even envisage their commercialization outside of the research field because Hossein will do the development with the uh, with the commercialization with the Geopeka society company. One of the main uh, challenges now is to in invest massively uh, to, to identify the origin of the wood. Until now we've done uh, samplings but often they were, with considering our means available, they were insufficient. So we tested techniques. And in the two years that are coming, three with Javier Thesis, we want to be able to study several events with sufficient, a sufficient number of samples, multiplying the approaches, uh, the isotopic, uh, metal concentration, taxonomic, approach in order to clearly get as close as possible to the uh, pro, the uh, feed, uh, feed zone and the reinforced arrows uh, approaches and the video analysis will tell, tell us where yes the flow of wood comes from the valserine and indicators confirm that it is the valserine so they will be will be merging with converging will have converging approaches to make sure that the results will be sound and robust after several years of tests and uh, we'll really get to a point, we get to an exceptional point where we are able to uh, touch, really identify the origin of the wood. And I don't think it uh, it is dealt with elsewhere in the world uh, with such a precision. Maybe Virginia has other sites in mind, but I think, uh, I think it is the only one in, actually in the world. Yes, it is. Nicolas Rabin, sorry, I'm asking a lot of questions, but uh, the, I like the I like the topic, so I'm taking advantage of it. One of the questions that uh, I have in mind concerns the 23 years of studies. Do you see trends? Can you identify trends or during the floods, uh, the floods that would generate uh, influx of wood? For uh, as a certain level of flood, a certain threshold, let's say a cent, a cent, one a hundred year flood, do we know that there would be a given volume of wood that will be produced regardless of the origin? 
but basically the ratio is there a, a topological a typ typology of loads that could characterize the influx of wood uh, that could be expected two approaches there well two strategies there is the uh, the strategy of uh, the volume of an exceptional float uh, virginia did show a graph that we may use again but if you if it goes uh, more than a centennial float that we know based on the size of the catchment basin the characteristic of the basins there would be a maximum and therefore we can compare we're able to compare from this uh, metadata analysis we can uh, we'll be able to compare the exceptional character or as a function of a production of wood so it is one of the ways and thanks to the swiss data that we can address for genicia for example the major volumes we observe till now are well below the uh, maximum theoretical maximum that we could uh, that we could calculate So that's so the question of uh, how we deal with exceptional uh, high waters and what flow can we expect if we do have uh, uh, exceptional flooding. But if we look at more uh, common flows between a 2 and a 10, this is something that we can do on the base because Osen might be able to speak of this, but we have uh, several dozens of uh, floods. So we know, for example, that the critical uh, flow for the arrival of wood, if we use the high, the, tr the critical flow um, that sets the wood into motion varies according to the floods and varies according to the floods, according to a, a preparatory phase that is more or less lengthy. And we also think that uh, if it's windy, this can play an important role in the production of wood. And we've seen here, for example, that uh, we're at around 0.7 uh, flow, the critical flow, uh, 400 cubic meters per second, if I recall. Uh, but when, when it's windy, the critical flow is at 100 uh, cubic meters per uh, second. So this is, something that we can uh, materialize and that we can also predict. So there are other models that are developed currently, in particular to predict uh, the flow of wood during the night and the total amount of wood that uh, transits during uh, a flooding event. So these are the two strategies and I think we have to separate these. So basically, what are the flows that we could expect for usual to medium size events and then uh, the how do we deal with exceptional floods and the estimation of volumes that we will have to manage if this type of event occurs i think these are two different strategies which are complementary and for which today we're starting to uh, have some elements thank you for this response Yes, so the predictive aspect of the volume of wood, I think, is quite important, in particular uh, for the management of uh, dams. If we had the ability to, to forecast this, I think it would be really, really interesting. And uh, also to continue to what Hervé say, uh, actually, now we, uh, in another approach, we, was, we are uh, modeling the pieces of wood according to flood hydrograph. So in the approach that uh, we have more uh, swamp uh, floods, like Q2, Q5, uh, so we uh, correlate between uh, flow discharge from one hand and also the, for example, the speed of increasing water level or I don't know the time since uh, we had a flood like this, for example, uh, we have one year that we didn't have a flood like this, so it can be an important parameter. So we contribute different parameters like this uh, to the neural network and by training the software, we did it actually on the river and we had very good results. 
So by doing this, uh, we can predict uh, what do we have uh, on a river. Just we need the statistics to be able to train the software, and then we can predict uh, according only to the flood hydrograph. And as you know, flood hydrograph, we can extract it easily from the site information. Maybe if I can share my screen again, I would like to illustrate this issue because uh, as we discussed, can you see the screen now? Yeah. So um, as we discussed, um, is the wood availability what it matters? So these graphs, um, sorry, they are in German, but what we have here is then the pieces of wood uh, transported. This is not from Genesia. This is another river in Switzerland that we monitor. Um, so this is pieces of wood. Uh, I'm not sure if you can see my pointer. Um, can you? Yes, we can. Yes. Okay. Uh, so pieces of wood here versus time and these charts in blue. So we had two uh, consecutive floods in a few days. And you see that during the first flat, uh, there was a lot of wood transported. And um, while the second flat had much higher discharge, uh, but the amount of wood in transport was much lower. So this is because most of the wood that was available in the river, that was stored in the river, was transported already during the first flat. So uh, a second flat, even with a higher magnitude, would not transport um, any wood because there is no wood. In the, this case, there was not additional supply from tributaries or from uh, landslides, for example, uh, and not a lot of bank erosion neither. So if there is no additional supply, then there would be not um, a lot of wood transport. So this uh, dynamics makes prediction quite challenging. So what we need is more observations like these to train this type of softwares and uh, improve uh, predictions and forecasting. And I saw this event, this phenomenon on Iser and A uh, clearly. On two other basins, I saw exactly the same uh, thing that you show us, Virginia. Mm -hmm. So th this is, uh, I think, because I saw in the chat, there was a comment uh, that in Geneva, they observed um, slightly the opposite, like the, during the first flood, there is no a uh, lot of wood, while during the second, the, there was much uh, wood. Well, the, this might be also related to the levels uh, in the river, so, um, and the address hole for motion of wood. So when the wood is deposited on top of bars or uh, along the flat, so on the flat plain or on the banks, of course, we need to reach this level to put this wood in, mo on mo in motion. So yeah, wood dynamics is, is not so straightforward. So, and it's very site dependent and flood dependent. So this is why we are still uh, researching. Yes, if the wood, uh, 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 is uh, carried uh, during an event from subcatchment areas upstream because this can produce wood. Earlier on, we talked about landslides or uh, rock slides, but at that point, this flow can uh, come with some lag time uh, with regard to the uh, downstream flood. That's possible if, to the contrary, the wood comes from lateral erosion of the main. Uh, branch of the river, then it will uh, it will arrive at the same time or just a little bit before the peak flooding. And this is what we observe in the uh, low valley of the Ain, for example. And it, it, if we simply the cameras might uh, allow us to say, oh, yes, this wood is coming along a little bit later on. So it really does come from upstream. And if we have a, a camera on the GIF, we can say it comes from the, the GIF or the arm. Um, uh, if we have one camera in Geneva and one upstream, we could have the Semin, et cetera, et cetera. So the challenge is to um, 
acquire this information so that we can understand these better. I think we've learned a lot with just one camera and we'll learn a lot more about uh, the wood dynamics with uh, a network of cameras over the entire catchment area. Well, this uh, brings us to the end of the session. I would like to thank everybody for par your participation. I would like to thank the speakers who uh, have uh, shared some very complimentary and contrasted approaches and very what brilliant illustration. I would like to thank Anita and Lionel for the translation uh, with a great deal of uh, professionalism, the, the presentations. So as we said, uh, these presentations uh, with the translated version will be available online on our website. And I would like to warmly thank Elizabeth Leniti, who uh, organized this morning's event. So I'm also going to ask when the videos will be available, George. And she said Wednesday. So uh, you will be able to access these videos on the website. I think that's it. We uh, have partnership with uh, some English and American uh, colleagues on uh, Wood and a seminar is planned for next May, a seminar which should also uh, create a bridge between the production of scientific knowledge, in particular on the Genesia site, and uh, river managers, the European uh, river managers from Italy, Switzerland, and of course from France. And I hope that if you're interested that uh, you you will be uh, very welcome to participate. We will start communicating on this new event uh, during the winter. It will be the event will be at the very beginning of May, and we will be able to go and visit some sites in Switzerland. Also, because uh, Virginia will be organising these visits for us, and it will be looking at a certain number of sites. So there are lots of challenges in terms of obstruction and risk management. Thank you, George, for your comment. Uh, indeed, regarding the amount of uh, wood in the minor beds, maybe uh, Javier and Virginia didn't say this, but we actually uh monitor the wood right through along the network because the fact that we cannot predict the flow of wood with regard to the peak of the uh, flood itself it means that the catchment area is functioning a little bit like a black box and that there are intermediate storage processes so we need to understand what's happening in the intermediate branch of the river that's a very very important thing to do